Chapter 21, Battle of Geonosis III. Upon reaching the agreed spot, we see Rail pressed against the wall with Barisofi next to him. The tattooed Padawan looked incredibly anxious, constantly sending glances out towards the arena floor. Extinguishing my lightsaber, I take it no one else came, I asked while Isla put up a simple illusion on the entrance. No, Yoda and the clones should nearly be here though. A couple more minutes and we'll make it out. Looking up at the sky as he replied. Looking at Barris once more I asked, What about your master? Why didn't she come? Making Barris respond, Master Luminara wanted me go with Rail, while she stayed with the rest of the Jedi. Smart move there, as if one Jedi is going to make a difference down there. Another company of droids just entered, and the strike team's numbers are halved. If Dooku doesn't stop them, they'll all be dead. From the safety of our hiding spot, I see the droid army complete their encirclement. The Jedi, who were severely outnumbered, began to drop like flies. Padawans, knights, and masters, there was no discretion between those who the droids gunned down. Somehow during this chaos, R2 managed to put C-3PO back together. I'll tell you one thing, that droid's got more skill than half the strike team, if he can do that safely. With the Jedi's defeat all but secured, the Count raises his hand to halt the massacre. Confusion clearly seen on the last standing Jedi's face, as the droids that were just about to finish them off lowered their weapons. While this is happening, the remaining scattered Jedi that somehow survived were pushed into the encirclement. Damn Kiati Mundi made it again. I'm already feeling back for the galactic marines he'll be commanding soon enough. Speaking loud enough for everyone in the arena to hear, he gives the remaining Jedi a chance to surrender. Being the smart cookie he, his master Windu, replies valiantly, we will not be hostages to be bartered Dooku. How idiotic is that? Surely knowing that the clone forces are almost here, he should at least take into consideration pretending to agree with the Count. What if something happened, and the Grand Army of the Republic comes a few minutes late? Windu's playing a risky game with all of the remaining Jedi at stake. Accepting Windu's answer, he commands the droids to continue on, refocusing their aim back on the circle of Jedi who are ready to fight to the death. Suddenly that hot piece of ass which is Padme, whom survival during this was fucking beyond me, brings everyone's attention to the sky. Coming down from above, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's an LAT gunship that started raining hell upon the droids. Man, those laser beam things are cool as fuck. When Rail seen the reinforcements, he grabbed Barris's shoulder and said, Let's move, I'll take this Padawan to her master, you two find your way to the nearest gunship, before dragging the Miriland down the arena floor with him. Turning to my master, she nods at me and charges back out into the fray with me hot on her tail. Falling through the hot air, I activated Force Valor, boosting my own and master's physical abilities up a level. Crashing down onto the sand, we began swiftly cutting through the droids blocking our escape, narrowly avoiding plasma bolts as we close in on a Jedi free LAT. The clones riding the low altitude transport began to blast at the clankers, giving the Jedi some breathing room to move onto the ships. The Jedi boarded the gunships, giving the clones cover to return to the escape vehicles. Stepping onto the nearest Elet with Ayla, we were met with an assortment of clones along with Plo and Ajin Kolar, a fellow Zebrak Jedi. Not wasting any time, the pilot took off leaving the arena and heading to the main battlefield where the majority of the clone forces were stationed. Flying through the air, Plo Koon said to me, Glad to see that you're well, holding on to the shaky handrail. Sadly, this battle is not finished. He's not wrong, There, this is the typical case of out the frying pan and into the fire, we're literally heady, nang into war zone, with little to no cover, and a fuck ton of droids. Turning away from the open door, I questioned the inhabitants of the ship. Do you know what's happening over there? How will we be stationed? One clone with green stripes on his armor stepped up. Sir, the forces have been stationed at the assembly area for each Jedi Knight and Master to take over, sir. Thanking the trooper for the information, I look back out the ship's doors. Rapidly flying across the sandy terrain of Geonosis, the L-8s flew over the landed Acclimator-class assault ships before sending rockets at the separatist constructs planted over the battlefield. I watched on, as one of the L-8s flying in formation with us 
topples an entire ship with a well-placed rocket before it could take off. As safe as being in this ship seems, it really wasn't. Ground-to-air artillery was constantly aiming for any Republic ship in the sky, and as good as the clone pilots were, they couldn't avoid everything. Before we reached the designated assembly area, one of the ship in our echelon got hit. The engines quickly caught fire and exploded, sending the hull in a fiery spiral down to the earth. So it was safe to say I'd rather take my chances on the ground. Luckily, that was the only transport that was hit by the time we landed. As the LAT was slowing down, Plo Koon said to everyone on the ship, Good luck and may the force be with you, jumping off the now static ship. I've never understood that saying, because the force is literally always with you unless you're a wound in the force. So it's not as if you can get rid of it that easily. Treading off, me and my master began getting debriefed by the clone captain that had striking red paint on his armor. Speaking through his visor, we have a platoon of soldiers awaiting your orders, ma'am. Awaiting further instructions from Ayla. Captain, have you been informed off the strategy we shall use for this battle? She questioned, pulling her lightsaber back into her grip. The clone responds with, We have intel from HQ that tells us we will be conducting an all-out frontal assault on the Separatist starships, ma'am. I winced at the answer. With tactics like those, it's a wonder only around half of the clones deployed died. I'm no tactician, but I could tell you that this wasn't a good plan, and so could all of the clones fighting. Is that all the information, Captain? Ayla said, as if expecting a, a more detailed approach to the battle. The clone captain shakes his head. Afraid so, ma'am. Thinking for a moment, Ayla speaks up. We will travel in a tight formation. There's not a lot of cover, but if you come across some, don't be afraid to use it. If you have any tactics that would help the situation, relay them to the group. Igniting her lightsaber, she turns to me. Like and stay at the front of the group with me. We will block as much fire as we can for the soldiers, so don't stray far from me. Nodding in acceptance. Yes, master. I pull my lightsaber out and ignite it. Ayla turns to the troopers and shouts, Move out! With it, us and the company of soldiers approach the front lines. Chapter 22, Battle of Geonosis IV. Jogging towards the front lines of the battle, I had an opportunity to have a good look at both sides' armies. Even though I will say that the tactics are stupid, the clone army looks cool as fuck, all lined up like that with the ATTEs and Sphays scattered around in between them. Almost makes it seem as if the Jedi commanders know what they're doing. Passing by groups of troopers with and without a Jedi leading them, we neared the forefront of the GAR's forces. The soldiers already there have began to shoot at the approaching horde of droids. It's still pretty calm, as both sides, heavy weapons haven't opened fire, but if you listen carefully, you could hear the lasers of the heavy artillery heating, charging up, preparing to tear down the Lucrahulk class battleship before it left the atmosphere. On the horizon, the large spider droids and their smaller dwarf counterparts slowly trudged onwards towards the clone legions. While the hailfire tanks plowed through all the droids in their way, rapidly closing the distance between the armies. Reaching the vanguard, Ayla orders the troops to prepare their blaster rifles. From where we were standing, I could hear the clanks of the battle droids menacingly walking towards us. Not going to lie, it was quite fucking scary seeing them all. Just the sheer amount of them was astonishing. There was an eerie silence on that battlefield as the two battalions closed in on one another. Ringing through the sandy landscapes was the sound of an ATTE's mass driver cannon firing at the Separatist army. At this moment, all hell broke loose. All units opened fire, blasting at the other side with everything that they've got. The Republic's artillery was mowing down platoons of droids with every sweep of their lasers, while the opposing side's tanks began launching guided missiles at targets across the battlefield. With me and Isla up front blocking shots from the troopers under our command, they had enough cover to freely fire upon the enemy. Using my saber staff to deflect red bolts of energy away from the clones, I heard the whistling of a guided missile coming at our position. Isla watched the guided missile as it drew near. When I was about to do something about it, she sent a powerful force push ahead, causing the rocket to explode midair and several droids closing in on us 
to become flyback disabled. The troops seemed to like my master's move as they began cheering as they increased their fire at the B-1 platoon that was within firing range. Tearing through the droids, the next thing that approached wasn't as easily gunned down. An AAT maned by droids swiveled its turret in our direction, sensing the incoming danger. Isla yells at the clones to scatter. The platoon scurried in all different directions, slenderly avoiding the blast from the tank's heavy laser cannon. Dodging the tank's fire, Isla gestures to follow her as she sped towards the tank. Hot on her tail, I quickly catch up to her. Advancing towards the tank, she instructs me, I'll cover you while you take out the droids, manning the tank. As she carves through a B-1 close to her. Cutting in front of me, she started deflecting the AAT's light blaster fire, giving me the opportunity to leap onto the roof of the tank. Cutting the head off the droid peeking out the roof of the vehicle, I direct yellow lightning through the hatch, chaining through the droids inside, rendering the enemy tank non-operational. With the troops regathering after that close call, Ayla orders some of the soldiers to commandeer the enemy tank. With that, some of the groups climb into the AAT and get it moving, driving to the front of the group to give the rest some well-needed cover. As we advance, the clone captain pinged a message back to HQ about the seized tank to make sure they won't have any problems with friendly fire. Pushing forward with the rest of the vanguards, we eventually reached some medium-sized rocky terrain that could provide us with some cover. By the time we arrived, we had only lost three clones out of the plal, a tune from well-placed blaster fire. Their rest of the non-fatal injuries were swiftly healed by me before they could become a problem for the clone that had them. Bunkering down at the rocks, the clones finally had a semblance of cover, and they made the best off it, mowing down the droids nearing our position. The soldiers operating the tank had it placed at the side of the rocks, blasting squads of droids two bits. The spider droid that was threatening our position was destroyed by elf fire from overhead, laser beaming the large droid in two before sending missiles at the separatist core ships that were about to take off. Through comms, the captain was told to focus all fire on the nearest starship, quickly relaying the information. For the boys in the tank, they began firing at the colossal core ship as it was taking off. The SPHAs shredded chunks out of the starship, making debris fall from the fall onto the battlefield. With some ship parts falling on our location, me and Isla used the force to bounce the debris away from the troopers to prevent any injuries. Every sounding explosion came, came from the core ship as its ascent rapidly changed to a descent. The massive spherical ship briskly fell towards the ground as it was falling. Isla yelled at the troops to brace for the shockwaves. When the ship hit T the ground, it resulted in an epic collision that produced a terrifying rumble along with a wave of dust that spread all across the battlefield. The dust storm made the fighting become even more chaotic. No one could see further than a few tens of meters in front of the Nang, causing people and droids to fire more wildly. This made it dangerous as identifying incoming missiles early would be difficult. With the Republic air superiority, they mowed down the legions of droids trapped in the dust cloud with little resistance, making sure to take out as much artillery as possible before the cloud cleared up. Which eventually did, as the vision got better, I could see that the droid army in this sector was dwindling, and it wouldn't be look before they were wiped out. Continuing to attack from this position, the battle raged on for another hour before the main droid force was wiped out. Looking over the battlefield was a depressing experience, although the clones under our command had extremely low casualties. The same couldn't be said about the rest of the commanders. On the blood-stained sands scattered around with the broken droid parts was the fallen bodies of thousands of clone troopers. Pieces of armor and flesh were a common sight, and even the modified clones couldn't help but wince at the sight of so many fallen brothers. I could truly see why so many soldiers were shook after this battle. Getting a call from HQ to report back to the assembly area for further instructions, we led the platoon back through the destroyed landscape of Geonosis. Chapter 23, Battle of Geonosis 5 The walk back to the assembly area was depressing as fuck. No one was speaking, just silently walking past all the bodies of their fallen comrades. 
I was aching to pull out my flasks, but I resisted the urge for now. Arriving at he assembly area, most of the troops that were on this battlefield had already arrived. Unlike how people normally celebrate after a victory, all troops were quiet and seemed to be thinking of something, while the Jedi with some of the highest-ranking clones conversed about what happens next. Walking with my master, we entered into a landed acclimator that the Jedi were using as base of operations. Reaching the end of the landing ramp, we were greeted by two clone troopers guarding each side of the door. They informed us of where to head in order to find where the rest of the Jedi were convening. Traveling through the hangar, we stepped into an elevator that was quickly set for the main bridge. As the doors slid shut, there was an awkward silence, as it was the first time we were alone since we came to the planet. And after all that happened, it was hard to begin speaking about the one thing. The silence continued for what felt like ages, the two of us just trying to organize our thoughts before we meet the rest of the survivors. Eventually the peace was broken by my master, who turned in my direction, and made a full bow. To can't say how sorry I am for bringing two into a battlefield like that. Even after you told me about the doubts you had, I should have took on board your input and not brought to on such a dangerous mission. That's my fault as your master. Taking a deep breath, she continues. That being said, I hope you haven't lost faith in me as I have thoroughly enjoyed teaching you these last few months, but if you want to ask the council for a replacement master, I completely understand. Right, I deserve a drink after listening to that. Who cares if the council can smell it off me? Pulling out my flask that read, definitely not a flask full of booze, I took a swig while Ayla, who still had a lowered head, waited for me to speak. Should I tell her she's flashing me standing like that? Nah, I'll take it as advanced payment for being such a good Padawan, gulping down a mouthful of jet juice. I wait for the burn in my throat to subside before replying. Honestly, I'm not really pissed or anything. It was mostly for your sake. You seemed like the type to do something crazy die attempting it. Same for Master Plo and Shaq T. Spinning the lid back on the flask. That doesn't change the fact that you did blow me off, and although none of you died that could have changed easily during the chaos, none of you even put armor on, one well-placed blaster bolt could have ended it for any one of you. Raising her head slowly. I agree, it was reckless of us to come unprepared, with clear unease in her voice. Toot was. Even though I do love having a pretty lady like yourself as a master, recent events have made me unsure about your capability as my master. I say dramatically. But with the correct compensation, I think I could look over this mishap, raising my non-existent eyebrow. With a happily surprised look on her face, she replies, What do you have in mind? For starter, I want you to turn a blind eye to any drinking or smoking I do during a mission. This was a serious no for Ayla. She likes people to be in prim condition while on a mission. Agreeing for a few seconds, she agreed to the demand. Good stuff. It's not as if I'm going to get fucking plastered on the job. And you need to start coming for a drink with me and rail once in a while, I said, leaning my arm on the hand railing waiting for her answer. Ayla runs her hand across her jaw before replying. Is that it? Seems surprisingly little. I thought your demands would be a lot worse. Now looking at each other in the eye again. Don't you worry about that. You only got let off easy for being such a hot master. The other two, though, I'm going to run them dry, I say while smiling naughtily. Ayla laughs, at the thought of me scamming the two Jedi Masters. You're quite the Hellion, eyeing me up and down. Doesn't look like it, though. Smiling at each other, the doors two side open, revealing the ship's bridge. Walking off the turbo lift, my master says, thank you, showing my handsome-as-fuck smile at the sexy alien, we head to the battle operations room. Entering the room, the Jedi that survived the battle, along with several clone commanders, were gathered around a table showing different hollow projections from the battles that were still going on. Discussing further plans with each other while waiting for the rest of the Jedi to arrive. Eventually, someone brought up the elephant in the room. Sacy Teen asked, What about Dooku? Did Obi-Wan and his Padawan manage to capture him? Responding with a grave face, Windu states, Sadly, no. Obi-Wan and Anakin were both injured fighting the Count. When Grandmaster Yoda arrived, 
he saved the two, but Dooku managed to escape. This caused various Jedi around the room to be surprised at the ex-Jedi, as someone who has the skill to avoid Yoda had to be an extremely dangerous opponent. We also have grave information given to us from Grandmaster Yoda about Doku, taking a break and letting the tension build in the room. He has informed us that the ex-Jedi Master Doku has fallen to the dark side. Shit went crazy when he said this, for the Jedi to find out a previous master of their order has fallen prey to the dark side was a terrifying prospect. As it could mean that Dooku is the first Sith they have heard of for thousands of years, effectively bringing the thought to be extinct order back from the dead. Questions and accusations were being threw from all over the room, none of the Jedi believing that one of their own could have done such a thing. I tell you, Geonosis had to have been the biggest failure of the Jedi in this time period. More than 100 Jedi die, plus a few tens of thousands of clones, all for what? The important members of the Separatists escaped with a large portion of the droid army. Seems like a big waste to me. A while later, the space monks calmed their tits and began giving out missions to each other. Some had to go and help out on different battlefields, while other had relatively simple missions. Including me, I had to help the clone medic squad search for survivors along with Barris since we were some of the only Jedi that could heal with the Force. That blows my mind. If I ran the Order, I'd make that shit a necessity for every Jedi to learn. Ayla got sent to a different battlefield with several others, so we were split up temporarily. Waving her goodbye, me and my new partner Barris head towards the hangar where the clones we will be working with are stationed. Chapter 24 Battle of Geonosis Six approaching the clones with Barris, the clones were idling around the hangar awaiting further instructions. Spotting us, they quickly stopped what they were doing and lined up in a basic standing formation, right arm raised above their head, as the shout in tandem, Clone Medic Platoon 34 reporting for duty commanders. Taking a step forward, Barris addresses the group with an amicable smile. I am Padawan Barris Afi. I have been assigned to lead this platoon along with my partner. Giving me room to speak, I tell the troopers, Padawan Lycan, pleasure to work with you all. Letting Barris continue on as she begins to tell the clones about their current mission. Holding a hollow projector in her hand, our mission is the search sector 507-5113 for any surviving men, pointing her finger at the two squares on the hologram. We shall be taking an L at holding two Bacta tanks for any survivors that need immediate medical attention, the rest of us will be traveling on standards issue bark speeder bikes. Any further questions? She said looking towards the stoic medics. In unison, the clones reply, No commander. With that, the clones split up between the Alette and the speeders. Turning to face Barris, I ask, Do you want to fly in the ship or travel on the speeders? Taking a moment to think, she replies, I'll go with the clones on the gunship. What about you? Till head over with the guys on the speeders. Make sure you give me a shout if you see anything from above. I told Barris, getting a knob in return. With that settled, I strode over to the troopers that were pairing up on the speeders, picking one and starting it up. Revving my engine, I looked to see if the rest of the clones were ready before giving them the signal to move out. Driving the speeders down the massive landing ramp, the group started heading over to the aforementioned sector. On the way over, we traveled through the remains on the battle. The lands all around us was scarred, the craters littered with pieces of machinery and body part, really not a sight for the faint-hearted. At least I'm not part of the group that's going to be recycling the clone parts. You heard me. During the discussion with the Council, I found out what happens to all the clones that die in the field. A specific force of clones are tasked with collecting whatever's left from the fallen clones. What they take back then gets used for skin grafts, organ transplants, you name it. Since all the clones are, well, clones, there's no rejection from any organs that are transplanted between them, which saves a lot of hassle when one of them in need off new body parts. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a great idea, probably saves tens of thousands of soldiers, but fuck being part of the collection team. Some of the corpses you see lying about are in horrifying states. The Geonosian weaponry all but assures it. 
If you get hit by one of their sonic cannons, your body basically implodes on itself, scattering whatever's left of your across the sand, and having to look through thousands of remains like that, count me out. Pulling up at a downed LAAAT that was pinging a distress signal, me and some of the troops made our way to the gunship, while the rest fanned out and scanned the perimeter for survivors and any battle droids that were still operational. With the clones at my back, I used the force to rip open the smashed side doors of the LAT, safely placing the rubble to the side. Me and the boys walk in checking the vital signs of any clones we passed by. In the cockpit, I checked the pilots, but sadly, they seemed to have died on impact. Both their helmets caved in at the front. Sighing, I turn round to walk back through the ship when one of the clones exclaimed, We have vital signs on this trooper. Analyzing the man injuries, He's got a two broken femurs, a dislocated shoulder, and possibly a cracked skull. Approaching the clone that found him, go and call the gunship down. Tell them to have a tank read for this man. I'll keep him stable, I said. I sensed the wounded in man's injuries with the force and determined that along with what the medic said. The clone had countless smaller fractures on bones across the body. Placing my hand on the clone's head, I aimed to heal the most problematic wound, before placing him in Bacta. Channeling the force into the MAM skull, I could feel it repairing at a rapid rate, all the while directing the blood back to its natural pathways, effectively cleaning the internal site of the wound. Less than a minute later, I finished the treatment and used the force to gently carry the wounded clone over to the landing gunship. With the clones making way, it didn't take long to travel to the LAAT, as the ship's doors slid open, revealing Barris and a clone medic preparing a Bacta tank for use. Getting the all clear, I lower the clone down into the strange liquid as a mask and several vital sensors attached onto him inside. Crazy thing that Bacta, I stuck my hand in a tub of it once and felt great. It was like have properly soft blankets wrapped round my hand. You could sleep in that shit, I'm telling you. After the medics double-checked that his vitals were stable and he was on the road to recovery, we started scan the rest of the sectors for any survivors. By the end of the day, we were heading back to HQ with the medics and four survivors from the battle. Sadly, that was all we could find during our search. Everyone else was already dead. Driving up the big-ass ramp, me and the rest of the team parked our speeders before waiting for the LAA get here. While we were waiting, I asked the clones a few questions. So, were you boys out during the battle? One of the clones sitting on a cargo container across from me spoke up. I can't speak for the rest of the soldiers here, but I was stationed in the field before this mission. With slight confusion on my face, a clone told me we were a hastily put together squad of medics. Usually it's just one medic per squad instead of an entire platoon of us. Understanding now, I look back at the first clone, were you under a Jedi while you were out, or was it just a clone force? I questioned. Just clones, sir. It was quite an experience. Nothing like the simulations back on Kamino. It opened my eyes to what war was like, he said. It was an eye-opener. There that was some pretty hardcore shit today. Pulling my trusty flask out, I say, Need a good wash, I feel disgusting, before swallowing a big swig of alcohol. Fuck, that's the good stuff. What's that, sir? asked a clone. This, my friend, is the glue that holds everything together, the thing that keeps me moving forward. With my words catching the clone's attention, I take another swig of jet juice. Here, try some, and threw the flask at the curious trooper. Catching the drink, the clone takes the first swig of his life under the watchful eyes of the others. Swallowing the booze, the clone gives a throaty cough before smacking his lips with a strange expression on his face. What is this stuff? It feels as if it's burning my throat. That's the best bit. You know, come on, pass it around. There's plenty to share, he told him. He told him. And so the rest of the medic crew got a taste of the holy substance. They all had similar reactions while drinking it. Don't know what I was expecting from clones. Trust me, you'll understand the joys of alcohol soon enough, I said placing the flask back in my robe. The looks on their faces beg to differ, but I know they'll come around. So any of you got names yet? I asked. Yes, I'm CT2. T mean a proper name, one without numbers taking up two-thirds of it. I cut in before he could finish. The troopers looked at each other, 
waiting to see if anyone has a name that isn't their CT number. Till take it, that means none of you have one. I spoke up after a few moments. No, sir, they responded. Well, all the better then. Why don't you start thinking of one for yourself? It's awkward referring to you all with a CT number, I told them. How do we choose a name for ourselves, sir? A clone asked. A fair point. I'm shit at coming up with names. I mean, my droid called Wires, for fuck's sake. Who knows? Just copy a name from somewhere, or just pick one that sounds cool. It's all up to you, I said. The situation quickly devolved into brainstorming session. The clones seemed overwhelmed at the thought of picking a name, so they didn't get anywhere on that front till I walked over to the clone that took the first drink of alcohol. Here, mate. What about Jet for anime? I probed. Jet, Jet. It has a nice ring to it. Sounds good to me. Thanks, Commander. With a wide grin on his face, he spoke loudly so the other clones could hear him. Boys, from now on the name's Jet, raising his blaster in the air, and the clones went mad. All cheering at the first brother to get Aname. Man, I underestimated how happy they'd get from this. After the first name, the other came soon after the platoon was elated by the time the L-8 landed. When the crew of the gunship came over, they naming quickly spread to them. A swell, while Barris told me that we'd have to report to the council now that we completed our task. Before I left, I gave the clones my hollow number in case they wanted to speak or needed help with something. Can't wait for the day when the clones are allowed free time. It's going to be some party. I better get my club bought and prepared for them. Chapter 25, Prelude to the Clone Wars With a light yawn, I wake up an unfamiliar set of sheets, scratching the skin around my horns. I look around the room till my eyes rested on a bombshell of a Pantoran woman whom I met while I was out on a bender last night. Man, was that a wild night. First time I've shagged in years, and it felt fucking wicked. Sliding to the end of the bed, I stand up and begin to stretch, with the tension slowly but surely leaving my muscles. I think back to last night's session. Your boys had a wardrobe change. It's out with the old and in with the new. The robes are gone, apart from one of, of the big loose one when he's on a mission. The rest of the time, it'll mostly be black trousers along with a black t-shirt. If there's variation, I'll be sure you let you know. Ducking through a doorway, I look around the apartment I've been brought to. Nothing special, but it's a clean-looking place. The living room has a big couch as its centerpiece. The grand location for the conquest I'm about to go on. Hearing the door lock behind me to see my partner for the night, seductively swaying her hips as she paced toward me through the small hall. Meeting her halfway, she leans on the tips of her toes as I take her lips in the first of many passionate kisses we'd be sharing tonight. Our tongues entwined as my hands slowly moved across her body, tracing her figure over a tight yellow mini-dress that complemented her eyes and markings. Resting a hand on the side of her face, I break the contact between our lips, only to dot kisses across her neck and collarbone. With her back against the wall, I pick one of the dress's straps off her shoulder, skillfully guiding her arm thought it before doing the same with the opposite one. Lena didn't want to be the only one stripped, so before her dress could slide down to her hips, she tore off the jacket I was wearing before sneaking her hands underneath my black shirt. Her cool fingers brushed over my solid muscles. As her hands continued to rise, so too did my top. Before I knew it, it was already off, and I was carrying the lucky lady over to her couch. Lying her down, I sunk my hand into her springy D-cup breasts, caressing them. Several times, as I worked my way to the protruding nipple. Lena's breathing began to quicken as my thumb began to play with her exposed teat, which then changed to moans as I brought my tongue into the game. Before she could get used to the sensation, I slid my fingers across her moderately toned abdomen, past a nearly trimmed hedge and down by she juicy slit. Lining my fingers up with her hole, I slipped two, thrusting them in and out as my thumb rested on her clit, providing ample stimulation for the Pantoran girl. Looking at her lovely golden eyes that were clouded with pleasure, I couldn't help but smile. Zeroing in on her lips, I kiss her. Slipping my tongue in as we rhythmically French kiss, guiding each other's tongues each time they come into contact, the pull continued, until Lena began to feel an orgasm approaching. Taking the chance to finish her off, 
I bring my face down between her legs and start using my tongue to play with her clit. This sent her over the edge, moaning loudly. She gabbed my horns, pushing my tongue harder against her pearl as her body began to contract and writhe in pleasure. As her orgasm headed towards its tail end, taking several labored breaths, she looked up to see me with a cheeky smirk on my face, arm rested on the top of the couch, awaiting to be serviced. Regaining her mental clarity, she already knew what to do. Rolling onto the floor, she crawled into her positions between my legs, throwing her dress across the room in the process. Hands on my inner thighs, she unhooks my trousers, pulling them down far enough to unleash the beast from its cage. Looking up at what could only be described as a huge tattooed penis. You head right, folks. My penis and balls are tattooed. Layla's shocked expression swiftly changed to her sexily licking her lips in preparation of what's to come. Grabbing the shaft with both hands, she gives the tip a light smooch and proceeded to lick around the head before wrapping it in her lips and bobbing her head up and down as saliva started trickling down the side of my cock. Removing her lips from my rod began to give my balls the attention they deserve, gobbling them up greedily as her hands keep jacking me off. Several techniques later, I could feel the cum threatening to burst out. Realizing this as well, Lena swallowed the knob just in time to swallow my load, gulping the white liquid down as it came out before cleaning the head with her tongue. No gani lie, that was hot as fuck from my perspective. With my erection still raging on, Lena jumped on my lap, placing my cock between two plump ass cheeks and leaning forwards to rest her doughy bosom on my torso. That was all the consent needed for me to line my dick up with her tunnel and drive home. In one clean thrust, I stuff her dripping wet slit. Going in down to the base, she squealed in enjoyment. She wasn't a virgin, so there wasn't a bloody mess on the horizon, and thank fuck for that. When she got used to having my mighty meat inside her, she started riding, hard and fast. I must say it was quite the tantalizing scene. The expression of infatuation on her pretty face as her tits were bouncing up and down made a great view. Wrapping my arms around her back, I pulled her body close to mine and started rattling her harder than she was used to. Snaking my hands down to her perky ass and giving both buns a tight squeeze, smacking them down into my crotch in time with each audible thrust, turning the pantorn into squealing mess, shaking all over my body. Lifting her off my cock, she moved into position, face down, ass up, and that is the way I like to fuck. Not wasting any time, I grab her hips and slam my stiff erection in once again, pile-driving her for the back, watching on as her blue ass had ripples sent through them with every thrust. Reaching forward, my muscular arms grab her beasts, stopping the pairs swinging with a squeeze before lightly pulling on their tip, making Lena beg for more. Balling her hair up in a first, pulling it back and giving her ass a smack as she was begging for more. The feeling in my stomach was getting more prominent. As her moans were reaching the peak, my load bust out, filling her right up with, with my potent cum. The feeling of being filled up tipped Lena over the edge once again, collapsing into a puddle of pleasure on her side of the couch. Once Lena pulled herself back together, we continued the act in the bedroom, fucking like rabbits for hours until she passed out, leading us to the current situation. Although I wouldn't mind having another round when she wakes up, but I've got shit to do before I go on a mission with Ayla leaving a message that included my hollow number if she wants to get in touch again for another romp, I left for my destination. Everything's just went tits up for the Republic, since they declared war. Everyone's trying to set up the clone army, so I had the time to get some stuff done. First off, I bought a club in the entertainment district, which is where I'm currently heading to. It's a swanky-looking place, and I got it for a killer price after threatening the arsehole that used to own it. Even came with most of the stuff I wanted already built in. All I'm needing is booze and workers in, then we'll be all good to start up business. Oh, and find Roz Lai. She's still not showed up, but it's only a matter of time before she shows up. Until then, Wires and his team of droids are in charge of guarding the place from unwanted visitors. Secondly, I've started to upgrade the astromech that got sent when the war started. Its name was R2K5, a unit with a black and gray hull. 
With the limited time I had before we set off, I managed to add rocket boosters to each legs and a stronger motor for mobility, plus a couple more self-defense weapons, specifically two miniature rotary cannons and a small stock off EMP and regular grenades. It's safe to say he'll be all good as long as he doesn't bite of F more than he can chew. Kitted out my armor with Django's wrist guards and added on the B2's wrist-mounted blaster, had to make it a hidden one though, the Jedi still aren't too open to using blasters openly. The control panel's great as well, connected it to my Delta, and it can operate remotely now. Reaching a nifty-looking club, I walk in through the front door to be greeted by Wires, who was patiently waiting for my arrival. Hello, Master, will you be staying for long? The droid asked. Nope, not this time. Just checking in before I leave for the temple to make sure you've not wrecked the place. After giving the place a one-over to look back at the droid. Has the drink came in yet? Some of it has. We're still waiting on around 70% of our total supplies. Wires responded. That's fine. Keep an eye out for it. Make sure no cunt tries anything while I'm away. If they do get rid of them, if they've got bounties, take them alive. Right? I explained. Of course, master. It will be done according to your wishes. Wires said before sending me off and going to rely my commands to the rest of the droids. Leaving the club, I start my accent to meet Ayla at the temple, hoping that the first mission we get is safe. Chapter 26, Escander, arriving at the bridge on one of the Venators. I saw Ayla speaking with a clone commander as the rest of the officers were booting up the ship systems. Turning towards me, she says, Here he is, commander. Let me introduce you. Walking over to me, she claps my shoulder. This is my Padawan learner, Lycan. All right, Commander, I said while giving his shiny clean armor a one-over. Lycan, this is Commander Bly of the 317th Star Corps. He'll be working with us for the foreseeable future, giving time for Bly to say, Pleasure to work with you, Commander, through his visor. Him calling me Commander gave me a fair bit of confusing prompting me to ask Ayla about how the command structure works. The hollows we got never really explained squat so I hope Ayla knows what's going on. Master, who outranks who if we're both commanders? I questioned. Taking her hand of my shoulder, she replies, Your official rank is Jedi Commander, which therefore gives you jurisdiction over all clones in the GR. Although this is the case, you should listen to what Bly has to say. He has more experience than the both of us with commanding others. Fair point, she's got there. It's better off giving Bly the reins, while me and her are on the front lines. Jedi sitting back commanding never made much sense to me. Of course, Master, can I know where we're heading then? I asked her. Moving over a table with a hollow projector, Ayla pulls up a planet for me to see. This here is a scander, which is where we've been sent. Master Vos has discovered intel on a new battle droid the Separatists have almost finished researching. All leads have brought us to here. Zooming in on an enemy base built around a mountain, this is the Separatist base where we think the plans and prototype droids are being held. Our mission is to retrieve or destroy the designs and prototypes before the Separatists can finalize the droid. Sounds like a lot of hard work. The facility's looking pretty bunkered down as well, so I doubt it'll be a quick fight. Fuck me, eh? Don't think I brought enough drink to last me. Understood. What about the troops? Is this all that's coming? I probed. Switching off the projector, Ayla tells me, Yes, all personnel on this Venator will be joining the mission. The rest of the corp are being dispatched to sectors where the fighting has already broke out. I nod at her answer as she finishes. Still, it's a solid ground force, 9216 of clones along with all the vehicles on board. If we siege the facility, we should be fine. General, all systems are online. We are ready to take off and enter hyperspace said a clone officer. Take off at will, Ayla orders him, soon after the Venator's huge hull began to leave the ground, quickly leaving the atmosphere of Coruscant and jumping into hyperspace. Sitting the cockpit of my Delta-7 me, Ayla and the rest of the boys were waiting on the ship jumping out of hyperspace. Current intel suggests that the Separatists have a munificent-class star frigate guarding the base. So to get our ground forces stationed safely, we need to take out that ship first. Looking around the hangar bay, I saw dozens of troopers rushing to get into their V-19 Torrent Starfighters, 
while others that had already reached theirs were checking all their systems, making sure everything's operational for the battle. Right now, I'm in a weird state between excitement and fear. Excited because it's the first time I'll have having some space combat. Fearful for the exact same reason. If fights like these, you're either going to die in an explosion, which is far better than the alternative of letting the vacuum of space claim your life. Who wouldn't be slightly afraid of floating through empty space till your oxygen runs out? Taking my mind off the madness that will unfold shortly, I put on some good old relaxing Gary McEff. What a fucking tune, man, brings me back to the days of getting pissed in fields with a bottle of tonic. Good times, man, good times. After raving with my trust astromech for a while, the hyperspace alar, Mem started blaring, prompting me to activate my fighter systems. The comms patched me into Ayla and several other pilots that were in our squadron for the coming fight, as she recapped the plan for taking down the Munificent. You all know the plan. Our targets are the shield generators at the stern of the ship. If we destroy them, the Venator will make quick work of the Separatist ship. Stay in formation unless I tell you otherwise, she told the us. Roger that, the rest of the squadron said. After the pep talk, the Venator's blast doors started the rise, exposing the ray shield that was keeping the vacuum at bay. Looking to my side, I asked K5, you ready, mate? Getting some beeps in return, which I understood as his agreement. Good stuff, we'll get through this no hassle, I said reassuringly as the first fighters began to leave the ship. Lifting my ship off the ground, its engines start to roar as my fighter was propelled out into the void of space. Quickly getting my bearings, I link up with the rest of the squadron, maneuvering into attack formation as we speed off towards the enemy ship. Diverting all power to the engines, we raced at incredible speeds, attempting to gain as much ground on the ship as possible before the release the vulture droids. I could see the ship clearly now, its janky look stood out compared the Republic's capital ships. Shortly after, though, hundreds of vulture droids that looked like tiny dots poured out the ship's hull. Luckily, the HUD within the ships picked them up, giving an idea of how far away they were. Through the radio, Ayla warned the crew, Engage attack systems. Those droids are closing in fast. Divert power to whatever you think's necessary to your situation. Contacting my droid, you heard the lady divert power between the frontal shields and weapons. I said as K5 done his job in his cozy custom socket in front of the cockpit. No way was I letting a random droid head fly with me, so I had to build a new socket for K5 since he didn't fit in the original one. With the droids homing in, Isla gives us a final piece of advice. No matter what, make sure we hit those shield generators. If we don't, this has all been for nothing. For several moments, it was just the two groups of ships flying towards each other, till suddenly, the first shot was fired. The swarms upon swarms of vultures fired at allied ships bringing a few down, but not without ensuing casualties themselves. Firing ahead at the approaching droids, I managed to take two out before the majority rushed past us. A pilot shouted through the comms, I've been hit! Already one of our squadron was shot down, crashing into an oncoming fighter before passing away in a fiery explosion. Not having time to think about the pilot, K-5 send power to the rear deflectors. I told the astromech, as I could see plenty of vultures turning to take our backs in the rear view camera, air red visors menacingly staring at our fighters. We were closing in on the munificence with the vultures hot on our tails, shortly after getting in the ship's range and unleashed a volley of fire at the oncoming Republic fighters, taking evasive maneuvers as weaved in between. Turbo laser bolts. Before we could start out attack, run on the shields, the vulture droids caught up with us, their numbers lessened from friendly fire coming from the capital ship. Another pilot was quickly killed from a vulture on his tail, not long after most of the squadron gained a tail as well. Yelling through the receiver, split up and meet back at the coordinates if you mange to loose your tail, Isla said before breaking off from the ground, taking some vultures with her. Dipping the joystick, my ship made a rapid descent towards the planet, pulling my two tails with me. Constantly moving my ship erratically, I managed to evade the enemy's fire, but don't manage to loose them. 
Identifying some rubble, I speed towards the shattered metal before slamming on the brakes and then boosting the thrusters. Successfully boost drifting round the rubble, I get a clear shot on one of the vol tours while also getting cover from the second. Sending a round of plasma at the droids, it is quickly dispatched, leaving me with only one left. Strafing between capital ship fire, I come up with an idea. Bolting towards the nearest turbo laser on the Munificent, I spin my fighter between its shots. With each dual shot, there is always a gap between the two bolts, and with the Delta-7 being so thin, it is able to slip between the space. Lining up my ship, I sense the beams of plasma speeding towards me. At the last moment, with the vulture still on my tail, I spin the ship on its side, squeezing between the bolts as they slammed into the droid behind me. Happy with the successful plan, I continues towards the turret and blow it up with some precision fire, turning my plane round and heading for the coordinates. K5, pull up the fighters in the squadron that still have a tail. Skillfully doing his duty, several ship came up on my HUD moving crazily to avoid being shot down. Heading to the nearest one, I snuck underneath the vulture blasting it from beneath, letting the pilot link back up with me. Thanks for that one, Commander, the clone said gratefully. No problem, A4, I told him honestly, before sending him some coordinates. We'll help out A7 and A6 before rendezvousing at the original attack point. Flying through the chaotic battle, we managed to help out the two pilots, all getting into formation as we headed towards the rest of the squadron, taking out vultures along the way. Closing into the coordinates, I seen Isla's ship along with three others approaching. Through the comms, Isla states, form up and commence the attack run on the shield generator's A squadron. Roger that, general, said the clones. With the team finally back together, we race across the top of the Munificent, weaving through fire along the way. Suddenly, Ayla tell me, liken me and you need to take out those turrets to give the rest of the squadron better chance at letting off their missiles. Understanding my orders, me and Ayla break off from the group, rushing towards the several turbo lasers guarding the shield generators. Weaving between the shots we fired at he stationary targets, disabling them successfully. Turning around, we seen a squadron launch their missiles at the generators, tens of them hurtled towards the target at high speeds before colliding. Detonating so close to each other caused the shield generator to collapse as it was engulfed in a fiery eruption. Target eliminated, said A4, as they ships swiveled round to meet up with us. Good job, A Squadron. Let's clean up the rest of these droids while the crew on the Venator finishes off the Munificent, she said approvingly. Roger that, General. They all responded. With the shield offline, the Venator went to town on the Separatist ship, destroying it in no time at all, while the rest of the fighters finished off the remaining vultures. With the first battle complete, we head back to the Venator and prepare for offloading the ground vehicles. Chapter 27, Escander 2 Here I was standing ankle-deep in sloppy mud, watching on as the heavy footsteps of A-at walkers splashed nearby clones, covering the shiny new armor most of them had. It's safe to say that the planet we were on didn't have the greatest of weather, reminds me of the mighty homeland. For the most part, the surface of the planet was filled with shrubbery and medium-sized trees, while the near-constant rain turned the ground a muddy surface dotted with puddles. Right now, the majority of the ground forces are heading towards a group of hills a fair distance away from the Separatist base to establish a command center. That will then be used to coordinate the assault, as well as give the army a resting and supply point. Wiping the rain off my brow, I turn to my master walking at my side and ask, Do you not want a jacket or something? As she was still kicking it in her usual sexy choice of clothing. Tom all right, it's not particularly cold anyway, she replied, clearly not bothered about her lack of jacket. Did you even bring one? I questioned as she continued trudge forward in silence. I'll take that as a no then. A while later, Ayla finally says something. I see you have had a change of clothing giving my outfit under the light jacket a glance. Yea, the robes were good for lying about and stuff, but they get in the way when moving quickly, too many parts flapping all over the place. I tell her getting a nod in response. Say, why is it you wear clothes like that all the time? Not that I'm complaining, thought. 
I ask, while definitely not looking at her inconceivable waist-to-hip ratio, slightly glaring at during the end of my statement, she says, a fair question. My outfit isn't very Jedi-like after all, isn't it? As she stepped round a large puddle. As you should know, my species doesn't have the greatest reputation when it comes to having reputable jobs. Most women, and even men, are used as slaves in one form or another. This has been happening for so long that the Twi'leks just accept this as the natural course of things. I trudged on through a similar puddle, layering my boots with even more dirt as she continued on. I used to be ashamed of my race, she said with a disappointed look in her eye. Eventually, though, I came to accept the sigma of my race, carrying it with me instead of being ashamed of it. Now I wear these clothes in a hope to inspire others of my race, to show them that you can still be what you want to be, despite being a Twi'lek. She finished her reasoning with a slightly proud smile. That's some pretty inspiring shit. That it is. Must be nice to do something like that, I thought, while taking a swing from the trusty flask. With a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes, Ayla looked at me and said, If one catch you giving some of that to the soldiers, I'll triple your training for the foreseeable future. Audibly gulping down the watered-down ethanol, I nodded my head. Fuck that triple training. There's hardly any free time already, never mind with two extra loads. The rest of the trip passed quickly. As soon as we got there, the clones rapidly put up defenses to protect the make temporary base. Walking towards the juggernaut parked in the center of the encampment, I climb up to the roof and enter the opened hatch. Surrounding a table was Ayla, Bly, and Lieutenant Gala. Currently, they were drawing up a plan of attack. Noticing my arrival, both clones salute me while Ayla gestures for me to approach the table. How are the defenses coming along? She asked. The troops are almost finished putting them up, should be done within the hour. I replied. Staring at the hologram for a few seconds, I asked them, What plan have you came up with then? Prompting Isla to move the components of the projection around, before saying, The Separatists have tanks guarding the path in between the recess in the hills that would be necessary for our heavy units to approach. There's hardly any cover for our troops so we need to find a way to let our army approach the base safely, whether it is through a distraction or other methods. Zooming in on a different point round the back face of the hill, she continues on. There's a path around here that's difficult to traverse, but it should be possible on smaller vehicles. Commander Bly suggested that we send a unit of scouts headed by Lieutenant Galley to check the base's defenses on that side. Looking towards her lieutenant, she says, I want you to take my Padawan with you. He will be able to notify you early if the enemy detects your presence. He's got sharp senses, so if he says they're onto you, make sure you get out of there. We can't alert the Separatist of our presence on that front or the plan will fail. Roger that, General, Galley said before turning to me and saying, Pleasure to have you with us, Commander. I'll notify the scouts to prepare for departure before climbing out the mobile base. When he left, I said, guess I'll go find a ride, later master. As I turn to leave, Ayla cautions me, remember Lycan, in and out quickly, no risky business. Tino, don't worry too much, I said, climbing through the hatch on the roof. Standing on top of the large ground vehicle, I stretch my back out as I survey the camp for the scouts. Finding a ground of troopers with distinctly different armor kicking about a bunch of smaller off-road vehicles, I leapt off the roof and headed towards them. Arriving at the platoon, I got salutes from the trooper as I walked by. Reaching Gala, who was already mounted on an ATRT with a spare unmanned one next to him, I hopped on and said, I'll be in your care then. Getting a nod in return, he shouted to the rest, All right, boys, move out. And we began the trek over. Let me tell you, riding one of the walkers is a back killer. The seat was already minimalistic, and it didn't help that we were moving over uneven terrain. Fuck me. These things were need some decent seats and some better suspension to go with it. Sore back later, we reached the point where we had to leave the walkers behind, for we'd be at risk of being spotted. Thank fuck for that. Slowly creeping up the far side of the hill, we avoided large patches of mud and puddle to minimize the sound we were giving off. Even though it was raining, it was better not to risk it. 
By the time we reached the top, we crawling across the ground, slowly edging forwards till we could peek over the apex of the hill. In front of us was a clear view of one of the base entrances. All we'd have to do is slide down the opposite face and we'd be at their doorstep. Signaling at the rest of the scouts to use their electro binoculars, I pull my pair out and get a good look at the, the defenses from this side. The things that stood out the most were the four tanks forming a perimeter around the entrance. They were positioned so that they next had any blind spots to take advantage of, as well as giving the defending side a fair amount of cover along with the light barriers placed in between each tank. Put together, they made a crescent-shaped blockade. Although they're set up solid, it won't be a problem to punch through if we get the jump on them. My probing of the base's defenses was cut short as in the distance, I could hear the humming of an engine. Quickly locating the source of the furring, I whispered harshly through my wrist guard, droids approaching fall back, sending my message through each of the scout's helmets. What then happened was as comical as it was effective. The entire platoon swiveled round and began to log roll down the hill at high speeds, only stopping when we reached some tree cover lower down the hill. Around 30 seconds later, the whizzing of B-1s riding atop their staps was heard, the noise from the engines growing louder by the moment. It seemed as if they had found us. That was until the noise slowly began to fade away, waiting an extra minute just in case. We carefully emerged from the shrubbery and gathered to discuss the next course of action. What did you boys see up there? It's better we pool together what we know before deciding on something. I asked no one in part, Eichuler. So in the time we had, I saw four tanks, three squads of B-2s, six squads of B-1s, and three dwarf spiders, replied a clone known as Alf. T counted five spiders, and I'm sure there is droidica hatches built into the inner wall, said another called Mach. There's two snipers up the back as well. Must be commando droids, Lieutenant Galley informed. Having a rough idea of what we'd be up against, Galley asked, what should we do now, Commander? Rubbing, rubbing my hand against my no-existent beard for a bit, I soon told them, we're going to wait here longer, double-check the defenses, and see if we can get the timing for the droid's perimeter check. If we know when they'll be coming round, we'd be able to get the jump on them, without risking or men getting discovered on the hill's incline. Once we've know that we'll head back to base and discuss it with the general. Roger that, Commander. They said, as me and the team began to head back up to our vantage point for round two. Chapter 28, A Scander 3 Back at base, me and Gale left the scouts and were currently finishing off briefing Isla on what we seen at the base. Good work giving us this information, you two. Gale, give my regards to the scouts when you see them. Turning towards Bly, she says, Contact all officers. Tell them to be here in the next half an hour so we can get the strategy finalized. Bly and Gal saluted their general before leaving the juggernaut, leaving me and Isla alone to kill time till everyone arrives. What do you think about this new droid the Separatists are trying to make in there? I asked my master. Hopefully, it's nothing serious that could harm the overall mission, but honestly, I'm not sure what they could be making. She replied. Moving over to take a seat, I say, if we're lucky, It'll be some weak unit that's not been fleshed out enough to work properly. Fidgeting with the displays on the projection, Ayla tells me, still, we should assume the worst so we're not caught unprepared. If I was to guess, I'd say there's a high chance of there being a droid factory within the base, so there's a possibility that they've already started production. Hopefully fucking not. The underground of the base is massive, and if her hunch is right, it could be swarming with droids. That's just bad new for everyone. We'd end up having to straight up storm the base, and who knows how many clones would die. It's not like me and Ayla can be everywhere to help them out. It's not like the clones are helpless, but if they come across commandos or B2s, they'll be in trouble. Commando droids are skilled fuckers, especially when they're up close and slashing with vibroblades. And although B2s are easy to destroy with lightsabers, the same can't be said about blasters. Their armor's thick enough to take several shots without going down. While thinking of all the scenarios that could happen once we break through the first line of defense, 
I pulled out my lightsabers and slowly span them around using the force. The sight of the spinning blades along with the accompanying light hum was something I found to be very therapeutic, at least half as good as drinking. Snapping me out my thoughts, Isla sat down across from me, pulling the sabers towards her, before advising me, Don't think too much about the negatives. There's no point in worrying about it just now, before we've even took the upper levels. Inspecting the lightsabers for a few moments, then pushes them back, as be made idle chatter until the first clones make their way in. Within the next five minutes, everyone was here, seated and awaiting for the general to start the briefing. The person in question was currently booting up the hollow projector and setting it to the right image. Turning round, all right, everyone, the scouts have given us intel on entry point here. Double tapping to zoom in on the place, me and the scouts were not long ago. The separatist defenses are significantly lower around here. Unfortunately, the terrain leading up to it is untraversable for the larger vehicles. Therefore, we will only be attacking with infantry and other light units. This will serve as a distraction. The rest of the army's forces will attack the main entrance once their attention has been diverted from the front, giving them a much better chance of breaking through. Looking at each of the clones, she asks, Does anyone have any questions about the overall plan before we go into the specifics? There was no objections from the clones. They all knew what to expect. All the training they'd done on Kamino wasn't for nothing. As long as it wasn't incredibly complicated or just batshit crazy, the clones wouldn't have any problems. Good. Moving on, I'll go through what each of your groups will be tasked with. For the best part of two hours, Isla, along with Bly at certain times, went through every officer's job. I never had much to do for the most part. I just had to listen to whatever part concerned me. Radically, what's going to happen is the army will be split up at around a 9-1 ratio. The larger portion, along with all the heavy vehicles, will be the force that attacks through the main entrance. The rest, along with me and Isla, will go through the back entrance and make as much noise as possible doing so. To help with that, plenty of troopers will be carrying explosives and launchers that will be used to tear the place apart. We're hoping that we can make enough chaos for a small team of people to slip into the deep areas of the base unnoticed. If all goes according to plan, me and Isla, along with Bly, Lucky, Devis, Inc., and Barr, should be in and out with some intel before the droid army retreats into the lower levels. And with that, the meeting was adjourned, allowing the men present to leave and tell their men what to expect for tomorrow. Leaving Isla to meditate in her quarters, I set off to find something to do. The operation will kick off at 9 a.m. tomorrow, so there was still a few hours till I'd have to hit the sack if I wanted a solid sleep. Whipping the trusty flask out, start sipping at the booze inside as I pondered about what to do. I could probably go and hang out with the clones in a while, but fuck going just now. I'm just out from a briefing, and I sure as hell don't want to walk into another one. Sure they're important, but it doesn't change the fact that they're boring as fuck. I can't even speak with K5. The arsehole's probably chilling out with a cold one watching the game up in the venator. Putting a cig in my mouth that is quickly lit by a well-placed jolt of electricity. Man, being able to shoot lightning from my fingertips is great. With time spare for the next hour, I began training my smoke illusions, which definitely wasn't an excuse just so I could smoke. Although the smoking aspect did make it more enjoyable, the act of manipulating the smoke into different shapes and sizes was pretty fun, which is why the time flew in. I only stopped when I heard a confused voice coming from behind me. Commander? questioned the clone. He wasn't sure who it was, but took an educated guess from looking at the large silhouette. Blowing the smoke away with the force, I turned round to see a clone looking dead at me, tilted head and illusionary question mark in all its glory. A right, mate. You all good? I asked him, getting up from my position. Yes, sir. Am I was just coming to inspect the main cannon, he said in return, glancing at the large weapon on top of the walker. Good stuff. What'd you say we wrap this up quickly then, and we can go and have some fun with the boys before the big day tomorrow, eh? 
Roger that commander, he said as he saluted, as we began to check the cannon at maximum efficiency before heading over to the main rest area. Unlike before, it was packed with clones messing around, everyone had been briefed, and now they're all buzzing with excitement for tomorrow. Everyone's doing something, whether it be arm wrestling, play cards, or even just relaxing with some music. Walking with my new mate Flack, we sit down at a sabak table so we can get dealt into the next round. Moments later the round finishes and we are dealt in by the clone dealer. Sadly though, the clones don't exactly have wages, so there was no gambling. Even so, we still had fun with a nice chilled out game before moving on to something else. Fucking around like this really takes your mind off the fact that there's a chance some of the troopers I played cards with won't make it past tomorrow. But I suppose that's just what happens in times like these. Currently me and Flack were relaxing on top of the same ATTE from earlier, both with a fag in our mouths, and both enjoying looking at the stars with some tunes on. Yes, the clone troopers now on the SIGs, all it took was a bit of persuasion and some demonstrations, and he was in, including a few others. What? Ayla said not to let the clones drink, never said anything about smoking. I'm just giving them the tools to pass he time with. Seriously though, no way I was giving them a drink, training's hard enough, never mind if she's pissed at me for hooking the army on booze. All J. Okay's aside though, her training's pretty effective, I've noticed I'm much lighter on my feet now, and all my movements feel swifter and more fluid. So even though training's a pain, I know it's paying off. Right, I'm gonna go hit the sack, yawned Flack, as he rolled onto his feet. Aye, I'll do the same mate, good lucky for tomorrow, I told him before he left. Me and the boys won't need luck to make it through those defenses. He quipped back, making me laugh as he walked to his quarters. And on that bombshell, I strode towards my bed, ready to get a good sleep, before shit kicks off. Chapter 29, Escander 4 Here I am, lying down on the same hill outside the base's back entrance with the same rain falling from the clouds. Unlike before though, there was another couple hundred clones along with their vehicles in formation behind me. Shuffling around beside me was the sexiest Jedi Knight in the Order, along with a few clones kited out with long-range blasters. The plans for them to take out as many as the snipers as possible before everyone charges over this hill. Nobody including me wants to risk getting shot in the back by those commandos. Be shit kicks off. Fire when ready, as the snipers had their sights lined up for the kill. Slowly reaching to my sides, I grasped the hilt of my saber, finger over the ignition, as I awaited the sound of the clone's shots. Seconds of silence later, multiple blue bolts of plasma cut through the air, impacting each of their targets as high speeds, rendering them inactive. The shots were a sign for the rest of the troops to start the assault. Men sprinted up the hill, opening fire on the droids protecting the facility. Running past the infantry was the groups of ATRTs that legged it towards the base, drawing the tank fire away from the rest of the army. Me and Isla, along with the rest of the infiltration team, ran at the enemy, blocking fire for the clone as we closed in on the battle droids. Pointing my hand at the droids, a wave of electricity was driven through each of their circuits, causing the B1s to twitch around as their circuits overheat. Isla was slashing at droids not far to my left, Bly and the others giving both of us cover as we make quick work of the group of BIS. The alarms to the facility began to blare as the hatches around the large doorway opened, unleashing the droidekas as they speedily rolled into battle, along with the clanking of footsteps coming from the main armored door. B2 reinforcements began to approach the battlefield, mechanically stomping towards the enlarging clone forces. From above, I heard the hums of the biz on their flying patrol bikes. As they began to fire, I deflected a shot back at the driver taking him out and watching the vehicle crash and burn as it hit the ground. Ayla Force pulled the other off his stap, thrusting her blue blade through the droid's chest plate. Head for those droidica. They're dealing too much damage our men, Ayla shouted. Revolving my saber staff around me along the way as we ran, Red energy bolts ricocheted away from our team with some hitting unlucky droids in the projectile's path. Nearing the four droid decas that were blasting holes in more clones than I'd like to mention, 
I grabbed one with the force lifting it in the air before throwing it at its nearest associate. With their shields deactivated, I sliced through the two robots as the struggles to break apart from each other. Already formed back on me, Isla took care off the other two in a different but highly effective manner. Pushing both droids back, their shields were deactivated as they were forced into a tumble, allowing the nearby clones to enact revenge on their fallen brothers, dismantling both droidekas with heavy fire. Not long after we destroyed the first group of droidekas, explosions were heard around the others. The clones with the rocket launchers had begun to unload their ammunitions on the separatist droids, taking out scores of them with each shell, scattering their metallic parts everywhere. We were making quick progress. The separatist guards were being pushed back to the entrance, allowing the clones to focus their fire in the one position. Although the B-2s had tanky armor, they never lasted long against the constant onslaught of the troopers. With the enemy forces pushed back inside, we successfully took the outer portion of the entrance. Sadly, this was the easy part. To proceed forward, this the next step off the plan, the clones would have to hold out until the main force brings reinforcements, and with a large portion of the security forces approaching our position, they should be launching their assault, well, very soon. Approaching the entrance with the infiltration team, the door was left slightly open, allowing Gale to take a quick look at what's down the corridor. The droids have already started to arrive. We better move quickly if we want in, he reported the rest of the squad. Smoke the corridor, like and spread the smoke out as much as possible, and try to keep us covered till we're out of their line of sight. Isla said as the clones started to switch their visors to the thermal setting. Moments later, Lucky Ink and Bar had threw their smokes through the gap. The sound of the smoke fizzing out was heard as I focused and used the force to quickly spread the dark gray gas throughout the passageway. After I spread it far enough, I gave the team the sign to proceed galley taking point as we quietly and quickly headed for a walkway going farther into the facility. As we moved, I controlled the smoke to coalesce into a thicker fog around us, further preventing the droids that were already from noticing our infiltration. Through the smoke, I could hear the confused chatter of the droids struggling to locate if anyone was breaking in and failing miserably as we had already reached a walkway and bolted further into the facility. After getting a safe distance away from the droids, we slowed down our advance. Right now, we were in the heart of enemy territory, and a simple mistake could end up with us being caught. Reaching a cross junction, Ink and Divis edged round their respective sides, eyes peeled for any enemy combatants when suddenly the walls of the facility began to lightly shake from the tremors passing through them. Even from where we were, sounds like the boys are going hard on that main entrance. Devis said with a smile, getting a chuckle from the rest of the clones, apart from Bly. Seriously, I've not even seen the guy crack half a smile the entire time we've been here. Come on, we're almost at a hatch that will take us to the lower levels. Isla said as we continued past through, currently clear passageways. Soon, we reached a dead end that sported a large gray emergency hatch that would take us further into the base. Quickly unlocking the seals, I lifted the heavy lid to clear our descent. One by one we climbed down the ladder passing several level by the look of it. After climbing for around two minutes, I reached the exit. Swiveling myself round on the ladder, I peeked my head out, checking for any droids on the new level that was similar in layout to the last. All clear, I informed, before letting go and flipping to my feet at the bottom off the ladder. The others followed soon after and me and Isla taking point as we pushed further into the base. Moving through the same gray corridors, I couldn't help compare the layout to a Venator's, consisting of many intersecting walkways off the same design. Raising my hand, I signal for everyone to hide. On my mark, everyone scattered to different locations in the hall, pressed up against a wall, the seemingly perfectly timed mechanical footsteps of droids began to louden. The muffed noise changed to clear, as they crossed over the intersection, holding my breath. I attempt to lessen my presence as much as I could as I eyed the passing group droids. Having several seconds to watch, it was easy to identify that the B-2s were escorting a tactical droid 
covering it from all angles as they moved past us. Having seen what I seen, Ayla signals to all off us to tail them from a distance and find out where they were heading. Cautiously, we followed the party of droids, making sure to stay a safe distance away in case they suddenly turned on us. Eventually, we the poured smile. Vevily their droids got to where they were going. A large set of blast doors opened up to reveal what seemed to be a control center, overviewing a large training room. Inside was filled with droids doing everything from logistics to guarding. This make it simple to locate the only living being in the room. Overviewing the training was a tall blue Skakoan, the large pressurized suit being a dead giveaway to his race. Silently he watched what was happening in the room, not turning round until the test was complete, beckoning the droids to approach. They stepped into the control center as the blast doors closed behind them. Chapter 30 Escander 5 As the doors closed in front of us, we quickly probed our surroundings for anything that could be watching us before approaching the doors. The man inside this room could be the key to finding the information about the new battle droid as well as bringing down this facility with the least amount of casualties. If he chooses to surrender, it would save a lot of lives that would have been lost during the battle to take the facility. Even if the chance of him doing such a thing is low, it's worth a shot. Done with the checks, safely converse about what to do next. They have a plan for getting in there, I tell them before explaining my plan quickly. Soon after I finish we begin, standing in front of the blast doors, me and Isla both cut small holes. Pushing the loose metal into the room, smoke grenades that Lucky and Devis prepared were quickly launched in as well. Controlling the smoke, I spread a thick fog throughout the room, signaling to Ink and Bly they passed EMP grenades through the holes while Isla moved them into position using the force. Several droid poppers later, Isla says, that should be all of them, as she ignites her lightsaber and moves to the middle of the door. Better get this open then, I said as I joined her in igniting a blade. Penetrating our blades into the steel, we traced a large circular shape into the blast doors, our lightsabers quickly heating the metal up to its molten state as the lightsabers sliced through the sturdy material as if it was butter. Meeting our lightsabers at the top of the circle, we move the excess metal from our path as I allow the smoke to drain from the room. Once the smoke poured out, we entered through the hole we made. Passing through the ring of sizzling hot steel, I get a closer look at the control room. It was similar to one you would find in a starship. There was many different screens showing information, images, and statistics, along with the scores of disabled droids that go hit by the grenades. Looks like your plan worked perfectly, Commander, Lucky said as he glanced around the room. Apparently not. We're missing the Skakoan, I replied, noticing the lack of a separatist captive. The weird-looking fucker must have made a break for it as soon as he seen us cutting through the door. Bly slice into this and bring up a map of the base and the rest of you see if you can find any intel on the droid, she ordered the Commander. Pressing a few button on the machine, a hologram of the entire base's layout appeared in front of us. Teeth seems that they were using this. All the passcodes are still in. From the hologram, we could see the base wasn't as big as we thought it was. There was only a few more underneath us that consisted mostly of storage rooms, not exactly the factory that we were expecting. General, I found something, Lucky said, catching everyone's attention. The droid they're working on seems to be an elite type of droid that's main focus is combating. Jedi, he spoke, giving a shock to everyone, especially Ayla. It says here that they're programmed to work in small groups to take down. Jedi, but that's all the information there is, he finished. Shit, the, Sk the Skakoans probably went to get the ones they've already built. I divulged, wanting to hurry up and find him, since any droids that are made to hunt a Jedi can't be good news. Ayla seemed to agree with me, but before she could say anything, Bly spoke up. General, Commander, before you both leave, I think there's something you might want to hear. Turning back to look at Bly, Ayla asked, What is it? Zooming in on a certain point on the hologram, Bly moved on with his explanation. This right here is the power generators keeping the entire base functioning, and right underneath it is storage rooms containing a large amount of fuel cells. 
If we blow up the generators, it should cause a chain reaction of explosions throughout the base, effectively destroying it. That's a pretty good plan. Saves us the hassle of trying to take the base. Our orders were to retrieve or destroy the droid designs and prototypes. The base can screw itself. I chimed in with my opinion. Bly, have you got enough detonators for the job? She asked, clearly agreeing to the plan. Bly looks at his clone comrades as they began to count how many explosives they had on hand. Quickly ending up with a total of eight, Bly tells the general, it'll be tight, but it should be enough to do they job. Being the generous person I am, I decide to give the troopers the detonators I had on me. Here you can have mine. Doubt I'll be needing them anyway, I said as I began to strip the detonators off my body. Once the total amount of detonators passed 20, everyone in the room bar me started to sweat drop. Ink even poked Lucky with his elbow. I thought Jedi only used lightsabers, he gawked. Me too, Lucky gaped as I finished placing the detonators on the table. Right? That's all off them, I said plainly stepping away from the table while the clones split them between each other. Once they were ready, Ayla instructed, Once you set the charges, meet us at the emergency ladder we came down on. If we're not there by the allotted time, leave without us. Yes, General. Good luck, Bly said. Same for you soldiers. With that we went our separate ways. Me and Ayla passed through the doors of the inactive white training room and swiftly made our way down the long one-way path where the Skakoan ran off to. The gray components of the corridors whizzed past us as we quickly reached the end of the path. Forcing the doors open, we entered what seemed to be a manual droid factory, parts scattered everywhere, along with the tools used to put the parts together. Even large pots of molten metal were spotted here and there. Stepping over the clutter, we remained vigilant for any one coming attackers, Lightsabers at the ready, we searched for the man in question. Checking round the back of a massive kiln, I rapidly spin round, ignite my lightsabers blocking an incoming electrostaff. The dark figure dropped from above, slamming his weapon at my head. The weapon clashed against my two lightsabers in an X-guard. The jolts of electricity wrapped round the plasma as if it was trying to draw it in, pushing my sabers up to throw the figure off balance. I thump a heavy kick into the chest of my opponent, pushing him back several meters, but otherwise not doing any noticeable damage, as its unblinking red eyes scanned my figure looking for weaknesses. Not having the time to engage in a stare-off against what I assumed to be the droid prototype we were looking for, I whip a saber in the opposite direction of the previous attacker. A second droid lunged at my back before his weapon was slapped away, slicing at the droid's waist with other saber ended in failure as the droid skillfully parried my strike. Making space between me and my assailants, I leap over the kiln to a more open area. Mid-flight, I see Ayla contesting against four of the same droids, weaving between their attacks with such skill it looked effortless. Landing on the cold concrete floor, I threw debris debris lying around at the droids hot on my tail. To my disappointment, they easily avoided or blocked what I threw at them, but not letting up, I charge at one of the droids. Throwing several powerful blows at my opponent, I broke through his defense, as was about to cut him down when I sensed a backstab coming from the other droid, rolling out the way I managed to avoid having an overgrown taser plunged into my back. My onslaught continued, a flurry of blows sent at both combatants, but every time I was about to get a hit in the other, would either block or make me put off my attack. I must say, these droids have some good teamwork. Most of the time people just get in the way of each other when fighting 2 vs 1, or the fight just ends up as many different 1 vs I duels instead of the two people actual working together. These droids were completely different, though they actively looked for weaknesses when the other attacks and effectively cover each other when they are in a tight spot. As we were Iting a mechanical voice spoke up from the back off the room. Ah, my creations are magnificent, and to think these are just the prototypes. The arsehole finally showed himself. He must feel confident enough to come out now. His droids have been proven capable enough to fight against Jedi. Not sure why he didn't just run away, but that just makes our job easier. Truly superb. I'm sure Separatist leaders will be most pleased with my creation, 
Now it has proved itself with a field test, the man said as he fiddled with his pressurized suit. Seriously, what's this bellin' going on about? It's not as if we're losing badly or anything, so I'm not sure why he's so assured of himself. Trading blows with the two droids, I managed to peek in Ayla's direction and see her being pushed back down the pathway we came from. Like and do what you have to do. I can handle these guys, she shouted at me as she can continually being pushed back through the long hall. Although she was loosing ground, Isla never seemed to be in a precarious situation. With Isla's blessing, I sent a volley of lightning at the two droids before coming in with a cleave to the nearest droid's shoulder. The droid's electrostaff blocked the electricity as we clashed blades again, only this time I aimed my wrist guards at the droid's chest. As our weapons were pushing against each other, the hidden blaster unraveled itself from my armor, drilling several shots into the droid's chest plate, disabling it. But to be on the safe side, the eye cut the droid into several parts, truly making sure it doesn't get back up. Flicking my wrist in the last droid's direction, I launch a barrage of shots in its direction that it swiftly avoided. Seeing my attacks having no effect, I use a force ability that would help me. Concentrating for a moment, I let the force flow through me, empowering my body and mind. By the time I opened my eyes, I felt great. It was as if the droid suddenly lost speed, dashing towards the droid. One rapidly swiped and lunged with both my sabers, leaving no opportunity for my opponent to counter. Breaking his guard, a quick cleave of my lightsaber, was all it took to send its head flying, as the rest of the body collapsed to the ground. By the time I finished them off, Isla was out of sight, but I could still hear the collision of weapons if I listened closely. That gave me the confidence to do what I was planning if I had the opportunity. Turning towards my target, that was currently scurrying away, and with me between him and the door, he was only delaying the inevitable. Rushing to the metal platform where he was, I cut off his escape and was brought face to face with the maid behind the invention of those killed droids. If his face wasn't covered with a mask, I'm sure it's be warped in a mix of fear and disappointment. Holding my lightsaber in front of his face, I ask him calmly, the designs for those droids, where are they? Even with my weapon threatening to pierce him, he said, I'll never tell you, the Count will have me killed if I give the designs to the Republic. Sighing at the man's refusal, I grab his suit with the force and dangle him over one of the pots of molten metal, asking him once again with more conviction, I'll ask one more time, give me the designs or I'll drop you. As I said the word my grip on his suit tightened, the metallic plates threatened to break as they began to creak from the pressure exerted. Please, stop, don't drop me, I'll tell you where it is, I'm begging you, he spoke. I'm sure he's really begging, but the mechanical voice coming from his suit wasn't giving him sympathy points. Where is it? I questioned, lowering him closer to the steaming how metal. Teats in my suit. Put me down and I'll take it out for you, he replied. Thinking for a second, I place him back on the platform and released his arms from my grasp, allowing him to tap several button in his mech suit, which prompted a data disk to be released from a slit in his side. That's the plans. Please have mercy, he said. Before replying, I put the disc into my pet, Arsenal Holo Projector, moments after detailed designs appeared in front of me. Happy with the newly acquired material, I release my hold on him. Thank you for your cooperation, I said plainly with a neutral look on my face. Aiming my wrist mounted blaster at his head, I blew a hole in his mushy green skull and watched as he fell back into the pot of molten liquid. Watching the Skakwin's body slow sink into the lava, I leave to go help out my master and leave this place before it blows.